Okay, so let's start. Uh, please uh, tell, tell, uh, tell us your name and uh, the place where, are, where you are now and place where you do your practice. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm delighted to be here and uh, to be here with you, Kamala. And my name is Alan Singer. Um, I'm uh, generally located in the Northeast section of the United States in a place called Boston, Massachusetts, um, which is known for its history and, and um, the founding of the country uh, way back when. But I really had nothing to do with um, you know, the founding of the country, just for the record. Uh, presently, I am located at a winter location in Florida, which is in the South uh, the, the southern end of the United States, southeast, and um, that's where I'm located along with my husband and our two pups. Mm, great. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's the weather like then? It's uh, beautiful, I imagine. It's spring there. It's lovely. It's, Florida is in kind of a perpetual um, uh, warmth, uh, unless there's an unusual cold front that comes through, but um, it's it's uh, located more. It's got, got more of a tropical uh, feel to its climate, and um, so it's it's very um, warm. Sometimes actually approaching even getting into the heat, um, even though it's only um, you know going toward the latter part of April. Um, 2020, then um, at least I'm oriented to both myself and the time, time, place, and person. Yay. Um, this is all hopeful. Uh, but um, at any rate, uh, you know, it's been on the hotter side of things lately. And um, yeah. whether that's a function of just the vagaries of the climate or global uh, warming conditions, who knows? Um, but, um, yeah, it's been, it's been pleasant to be able to walk the pups outside during the course of the winter months and, um, to be able to wear, you know, clothing that, uh, is not encumbering. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I, I've been, uh, imagining you and, uh, today that you are there and it is warm there, uh, anyway, warmer than here, even though it's spring and beautiful, uh, weather in in Poland uh, now, but it's not uh, it's not that hot. But uh, wow! Uh, uh, so I, you're entering into your springtime as we speak. There are <laughs> flowers um, emerging. Yes, love to hear that. I don't know in the interview um, format or the kind of conversation. I like to think of this as a conversation, yeah. um, as I tend to think about from a Gestalt perspective. You know, we're we're having conversation together. And um, since I tend to uh, enjoy mutuality and reciprocity, you asking me about my climate. Oh, so now how's your climate? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I will only, uh, maybe narrow down to this uh, sentence that it's beautiful. And I can see a park uh, uh, out of my window. Uh, you know this uh, green, uh, green, which is uh, typical for spring. Very, Lovely. Yeah, Lovely. yeah. So ah. It's uh, it is very you know uh, good for eyes. Uh, I don't know how to put it. That it it comes into eyes. And beautiful to see and to witness yes, the, yes. Um, the uh, nature in front of you. Yeah, yeah. Is that accurate? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Before actually getting to questions about Gestalt and Gestalt therapy, we've prepared some general questions and about humans and and you as a human. So there's rumors to that effect. <laughs> oh, so if you could say about your you know passions and interests and qualities that you would share with me now. Ah. I'd love to. Thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. um, I'm somebody who enjoys, I love range. I, I tend to think of myself as having a musical sensibility and maybe I'm, uh, you know, living aspirationally up to my last name, which is singer. Um, so I play piano and um, I used to play guitar, but um, more piano is my affinity. And um, I, I enjoy 
I enjoy the sense of musical range and the mm -hmm. depth of resonance. Uh, so when I think about my musical inclinations playing piano, um, and then I think about my affinity for instruments such as the oboe, even though I don't play that, or the flute, even though I don't play that, I just think about range and resonance and how that, um, that somehow speaks to me in my innards. So I, I, I really appreciated having that foundation in learning to play piano, in singing, uh, being in choral groups along the way growing up. And then in this more recent oh, last 15 years, I've been actually doing some community theater and performing um, in musicals uh, and being able to enjoy that experience of connection and collaboration with other people who are um, bringing their voices out into the world and their um, presences out in the world. And in some ways that, that kind of informs a zeitgeist of mine, which is in terms of my work as a psychotherapist over the course of my career, really wanting to support people locating their own presences, their own voices, and being able to claim their authentic selves in so doing. Um, so that um, maybe just as of a gestalt, so to speak, in terms of what I find, uh, what I feel passionate about. Um, and I feel passionate about trying to lead with kindness. Um, I have a, um, I have an interest in, um, in getting to know whom I'm with. And I certainly feel um, a, a mutual pleasure when that's reciprocated. Uh, so, you know, certainly in a therapy relationship, um, there's more of a directionality perhaps in, in, in my interest, you know, for the other but the other being um, part of a co collaborative connection, well, we're, we're, um, we're basically creating a relationship, a relatedness together. So I like leading that with that part of myself in the world. I'm interested in others um, until given an opportunity to not be interested, um, that can happen. Um, but gen gen generally, I like to lead with kindness, I like to be able to also laugh whenever that might be aesthetic. Sometimes um, it, I might not be so aesthetic about it, but I tend to um, think again in terms of range um, and both the, um, the serious uh, seriousness of life's prospects, um, as well as trying to experience the, the um, sillier side of life and um, being able to hold that as part of my, my bearing. Um, and sometimes it's that lightness of bearing that um, I think I find sustenance in, and that seems to sometimes be useful to others as well. Um, there's a um, an old saying from a magazine called Reader's Digest. Mm -hmm. uh, they used to have a column that was called Laughter is the Best Medicine. And I grew up in a household in a family where my mom's laughter was very buoyant and I mean, it could be like a guidance system, and it drew people to her. And my father, um, may they both rest in peace, my father's sense of humor was very dry. Um, so there was a lot of laughter in my household. And so mm -hmm. if laughter is the best medicine, one of my favorite things to say is that I think I grew up over-medicated. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, aesthetic, aesthetic for sure. Mm. Uh, and this, uh, uh, because you said kindness, uh, this is uh, the uh, uh, right word. I I heard I, uh, kindness because yes. you, you indeed are. Um, yeah, I uh, yeah somehow I experience you as really uh, a kind person and a, a person uh, and this kindness is somehow. Um, yeah, somehow transferred to, to the other. And uh, it is interesting for me because it's, uh, it sounds like this is like an uh, attitude you, you somehow you, you've developed also throughout the years. If, do, do I, um, did I understand it right? Or? You're receiving me um, 
love in a lovely way, yes. Um, and I, I, what I'm thinking of as you're saying this is having grown up um, in a family where, again, from my parenting um, in, in growing up, I felt like I was offered a, a, a wonderful sense of consistency and kindness and felt very loved in that way. Um, and then moving out into the world as a child and discovering that kids can be cruel and that bullying around differences and how people um, have the capacity to perceive one another and in more personal ways, how I was perceived at times as not being um, somehow acceptable as I, in my Alan Singerness, um, and however I was being present, um, um, I wasn't, you know, a, a star on the athletic fields of life. Um, so from that standpoint, being judged um, as sometimes not good enough um, and being, you know, treated to some bullying or mistreated is more apt um, to bullying or what I now frame as social abuse. Um, that, I think, was something that I registered in various ways, one of which early on, I thought, well, how can someone else judge me when they don't really know me? Mm -hmm. And so I think that that becomes part of an essential sense of my interest in knowing others for who they are and for how they experience the world um, from, in a certain way, not feeling um, received well in my earlier childhood experiences growing up that way. Um, and then at the same time, you know, we develop sometimes resilience um, and we cultivate our capacities out of experiences that challenge us. Um, and so I think that, you know, when I say it, I like to lead with kindness. I'd never stopped um, wanting to experience the way that I have felt loved and I feel that appreciably in my in my um, growing up years with um, you know again with a family foundation that way um, to be able to extend that kind of I'll call it love in the world um, mm -hmm. to be able to show up with interest in others for knowing who someone or some others are in their internal experiences and um, how people have survived their challenges and found their strengths in the midst of it. I think that there's a narrative continuity for that from my own childhood experience to the present, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It does, uh, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. You would like to add something? Uh, I'd just like to add that I'm, I'm noticing you on the other side of our um, screen and I'm appreciating your um, your interest and your smile and your kindness that I'm projecting um, is a part of who you are just from what I'm noticing in your eyes and, and your, your, your bearing. So um, I'm enjoying being here with you. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I, I also uh, somehow I am also kind of uh, attracted by your um, I don't know how to call it, but I, I will call it a Baroque uh, language. I mean, the, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, that it is like uh, po poetry uh, and uh, in writing and in and both in writing and in speaking. Uh, uh, I don't know if, obviously you know that of yourself, no? People. I've heard people tell me at times that um, mm -hmm. when I speak, that there may be a poetic quality to it. Um, and when I hear Baroque, I think of Baroque music and, you know, kind of a, um, maybe an older form of um, um, a more traditional or maybe um, uh, um, Baroque, um, maybe more embellished form of musical expression. Um, and then the silly part of me, it can translate Baroque into broke. Oh my God! Yeah, I, I'm, I'm there. I am being my own broken spoken self. <laughs> ah, yeah. This is also, uh, yeah, uh, both actually. Maybe, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're right, but uh, but I like it. And besides, I like this baroque music. <laughs> mm, mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So. I I tend sometimes to think, um, but I don't like to be too pejorative about my way of expressing myself. But you know, I'm not known for 
uh, pithiness, for succinctness. Um, and, you know, it would be nice if I could develop and cultivate more of that quality. Um, but I think I, I wrote so many papers in college and um, using, you know, words that I thought, you know, the bigger the words are, the more it would take up the length of the paper. And, uh, you know, I would be able to hopefully pass the course, uh, which I did. I did pretty well. At any rate, um, I think it's turned into my speaking style, or maybe it's always just been a part of who I am. Who uh, knows? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Somehow, we just ultimately have to show up in the best way that we can and uh, communicate as we best can and hope for the best. <laughs> I try to stay tuned in to see, you know, it, it, um, you know, are you with me? Are you not? You know, when I'm saying this, you, I mean you, or it can be others, because I, I, I do have an interest in it not, you know, being kind of a um, um, whatever uh, self-serving monologue that I really do like to stay in contact. And uh, so part of my um, speaking is um, trying to also pay attention to whom I'm talking with and to make sure that it's talking with and that it's not talking just to. Um, so I pay, try to pay attention to the cues that I'm, I'm looking at. You're nodding now. I notice, again, your eye contact and you're smiling at the moment. Um, so I, I register all that as part of how I calibrate and then try to punctuate even though it may not be in evidence at this moment. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I would say it, it's not only about, I guess, uh, about showing up, but also about um, engaging. I can feel that this is your way of engaging. So yes. sorry for, but uh, this is how I see it. Uh, yes, no sorry necessary. I love that you use the word engaging. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's um, that's um, something that I'm I'm hoping that uh, we're engaging presently, and that you know you're feeling in a sense of engagingness with me. And uh, feel free to talk or you know come in with your voice at any points, because um, you know I I really do like the um, the sense of our being together yeah. relationally in this moment. Mm -hmm. It's part of what draws me to Gestalt. Yeah, uh, so still before getting to <laughs> these very questions. Forget I even said Gestalt. <laughs> yeah, we have, like the question now is who has had the most impact on who you are? Uh, you, you partly uh, touched uh, those, this question maybe, but yeah, but if you could say, you said something about your family, but maybe. Uh, mm. I'd say my mom is my biggest nurturing influence in life. Um, and her ability to find the laughter in life, um, her stories of her own growth and development and the ways that she persevered um, through living through the Great Depression back in the 1930s. Um, and through her, her sense of determination, um, as well as her genuine interest in, in people. When I used to go out with her as a kid to, you know, she'd go to the center of town to go grocery shopping or to meet with one shopkeeper or another, and she would always engage in conversations and find out how they're doing. And, um, you know, it, it was almost like an early, um, an early primer in, learning how to show interest mm -hmm. and that that our stories in life are are mm -hmm. held in that kind of mutual conversation um it, it, the downside to that is that sometimes those shopping expeditions you know were long and i was ready to go home <laughs> mom can we go home already <laughs> but the other side of that message is that you know there's some wonderful things to discover when we talk and uh, engage in conversation um, and engaging. So um, yeah, I would I would give my mom mm -hmm. that that shining north star of credit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone else uh, you would like to add here, or, or just in terms of my personal life now, or yes. not just all? Not just all. No. Yeah. <laughs> well. 
I certainly, I mean, that, that's an early influence. Um, I mean, I love that I felt cherished by my father in various ways, but um, again, I feel like my mom's imprint was, was that much, um, um, that much more in terms of a central sense of my emotional bearings. Um, and then in my adult life, I mean, my, my gratitude for having found a special someone in my life, my husband, uh, now 37 and a half years, we've been coupled for 37 and a half years. Um, and um, we've um, now been married for a year and a half. So we're newlyweds um, in the midst of a 37 and a half year coupling. And, mm -hmm. But who's counting? And it feels like 37 and a half minutes, more like it. Um, but um, yeah, we've, um, we've, you know, had a certain balancing of um, uh, for one another. And um, I really appreciate that he shows up with, with his caring self and with his goodwill, even though, you know, in our complementariness, he's so, he's so much more organized. Uh, he's retired now as an eye doctor. So he's very precision oriented. Mm -hmm. And you know, what line do you see more clearly this line or that line? And um, I'm interested in supporting clarity as well. Um, but my sense of spaciousness <laughs> around what constitutes some ambiguity. Um, and, you know, there's often a lot of ambiguity that we're traversing in life. So I, I think that we, you know, complement each other in those uh, respects. Um, he's very kind and very people-centric. Um, he, uh, you know, really values friendships in the way that I do. And, um, and I love that we have one another's companionship um, and so I don't I don't take that for granted really having um, you know experienced enough of what loneliness can feel like and growing up as a gay identified person who came out you know really more in my early 20s but who was always aware of my sense of differentness in that sense um, and uh, being a bit of um, a gender call it outlaw from that stand, uh, standpoint of what's expected, um, you know, in that sense of having to maintain a, a kind of uh, invisibility or anonymity um, for self-protection over the course of many years of growing up. There's a certain loneliness, I think, that comes from that experience. Um, and let alone, you know, adult life and dating and, you know, you know heart gets you know enchanted and then gets broken and so forth in the course of social experience and dating and all um so i i i never forget that um i feel really fortunate to have found someone special um that um i can spend all of these adult years with and even when we're driving each other crazy um i you know i try to remind myself it's not always successful but i try to remind myself and what what was it that I really loved about this person that, that made me, oh my God, there, we, there he goes again being me. And I'm sure he's always saying, oh, there I go again being me. And that's how, you know, we dance. We learn to dance with each other in that way. Um, but I, I really never forget in my heart of hearts that, um, um, that I feel really fortunate. Not everybody has that experience in life. Not everybody necessarily wants that experience of life. And there are so many ways to live a life and being in a couple is just one way. Um, and I'm glad that for me that it, it's worked out in this way. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's my other um, mm -hmm. grounding yeah. influence. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for sharing also this adult, uh, uh, somehow in influencer. <laughs> mm. well, uh, thank you for being interested in, in knowing. That's, mm -hmm. I, I, I appreciate your interest. Yeah, I, you know, I, my tendency would be to ask, no, how about you? <laughs> but I, I know that that's probably not the nature of this yeah. interview. Yeah. I have to try yeah. to be a good client. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> be compliant. <laughs> uh. But in that, let's leave that for uh, other opportunities then. Yeah, exactly. And hopefully we, I, I will meet uh, Emil uh, one day. Uh, Thank you. And for me, Stefan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Yeah. We'll hope, I'll, I'll hold that all as a, as a prospect. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So now, how, how did you come to Gestalt Therapy at last? Uh. 
Gestalt. Well, back in the 1970s, mm -hmm. as I was exploring what I wanted to do with my, um, my professional life, I was working at an inpatient psychiatric hospital at that point and had some experiences in therapy as a client and, and um, thought, oh, well, you know, this could be a really useful way of moving in, in um, my work interest. Um, and then I explored, there was a whole humanistic movement back in the 1970s that maybe began earlier than that in the 60s, perhaps, or whenever. I mean, Gestalt therapy has been informed, you know, earlier on into the, um, the 1900s, et cetera. At any rate, um, there was one of my um, workshops I took was in Gestalt therapy. And I really fell in love with what I was experiencing from that two-day workshop and learning about the um, cycle of contact um, and, you know, from contact and withdrawal from contact and, um, you know, the movement um, um, toward um, connection and um, toward uh, building, building the contact. Um, and all of that just seemed to set really well with how I experience understanding of being. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew that I wanted to, to learn more. So after I then proceeded on to graduate school, which was not, didn't have anything to do with Gestalt therapy per se, um, this was um, at Boston University School of Social Work, uh, I, I knew that I wanted to do more training. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew that it was just going to be a matter of time that I found my way back to more of a thorough Gestalt training program. So back then, in, I think it was around 1981, um, um, I joined a two-year training program through the Gestalt Institute of New England um, with uh, mentors, uh, um, Lee Geltman, Alan Robinson, Kathy Hearn. They were the three, the triumvirate. And they were very tuned into group process. We had uh, one weekend residential every month. Um, for two years going that um, we met and learned Gestalt theory and Gestalt therapy by being a group ourselves mm -hmm. and by learning the theory and the principles and the interruptions to contact or the resistances to contact um, and, uh, you know, various and sundry principles related to, to the foundations of Gestalt therapy. We read um, the pollster's book, Gestalt Therapy Integrated, which mm -hmm. for me, I just felt it was very readable and very intelligible. I could get it. Um, it mirrored what I was learning in our um, training program. And again, it's like when you, when you meet someone that you cultivate a sense in whatever time you do of feeling at home with, um, it's like meeting a theory um, and a way of um, informing perspective and perception and um, what to look, how to look out into the world in a way that helped me feel more grounded and that also felt authentic to my being in the world and how I understand being in relation in the world. So I just loved, I loved the theory from that experience. I loved learning it. It really helped me um, bear the anxiety of being an early mm -hmm. um, therapist in my own training. Mm -hmm. And um, that enabled me to, to, to feel like I could sit in that seat with a, um, a prism, a way of looking, uh, looking out and experiencing our relatedness in a therapy um, uh, engagement um, and uh, to be able to then use my awareness in a way hopefully that would be useful to others um, at least some others um, so that was my initial foundations was the Gestalt Institute of New England I then over the course of some years I took other different types of training programs as well um, but it, it was the Gestalt theory that remained like um, my in my innards um, and 
I then uh, took a, um, a, a family and couples training program with Sonia Nevis um, and Josie Zinker. Uh, that, um, that was its own wonderful experience. I wound up you know, doing um, a supervision group with Sonia um, as our supervisor and talk about succinct and pithy. She was like a, a Yoda, if you know the reference <laughs> to Yoda in Star Wars. She was like a, a Yoda, She's so compact, and she spoke with such compactness in a way that, you know, I would need a, a, a transplant, a brain transplant to ever accomplish that. At any rate, um, um, I, I really valued her. I wound up then taking a training program with the pollsters out in San Diego um, because I loved their book so much and I wanted more of their experience. Um, and I then also continued on with my Gestalt Institute of New England faculty and have been a member of a graduates group there mm -hmm. for, um, oh my God, so many years since the 1990s. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've, just wanted to stay connected and attached to mm -hmm. what feels so nourishing. Why would I give up um, things that feel so nourishing? You know, and then when I go to these workshops, I mean, between the Resnicks, um, Bob and Rita, and, and uh, there's Stella Resnick, there's so many people that I could easily, you know, if, if I felt that I wanted to at this point, although I'm a little further along in my, um, my career process, I'm kind of in the winding down phase, if anything. Um, but I'm not winding down my interest in Gestalt. I'm a member of AHET, which, you know, is just such a, um, it's Gestalt brought, brought to its organizational level, and then to it, the group levels, and then to our individual connections within it. So I'm living my life through this Gestalt lens that just continues to nourish me. And um, um, I, I just love feeling that it's been a part and parcel of. Mm. Those in you. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, there oh. you are. Oh, yeah. you got <laughs> Part and parcel, this is uh, what I've heard. Uh. <laughs> the Gestalt experience and theory has been part and parcel of my being and how I've been in, in my practice mm -hmm. and in life in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And has that, I mean, like the focus on theory or on practice, uh, uh, has that been changing over the years uh, to, to, for you or like you were trying to balance or you were uh, yeah I wonder the theory more or practice or I think that they've gone um, in they're in an inter co-informing intermingling mm -hmm. um, co-fertilizing way um, if anything I feel a little bit more, maybe even a lot more at ease with myself over the course of years. <clears throat> call that aging, call that the loss of brain cells. <laughs> a lack of editorial self-regulation, I don't know. It could be a good thing. Um, that I've, I feel a maybe more confident, more trusting, that I will show up for engaging with clients in my practice and with people in my life, period, whether they're in, it's in a professional therapy relationship or, in quotes, or, um, um, you know, just being a person and with other persons, human among humans, mm -hmm. that I'm freer in being myself. And so that the theory and practice feels like it's more of an integrated mm -hmm. part of myself sensibility. Um, I feel maybe a little less... Um, uh, formulaically informed um, because I trust that I've integrated over the course of these years a lot and yet when I say that you know I'm a learner among learners and um, you know there's so much more to learn and the discourse you know with all of our 
various esteemed Gestalt folks, um, there's so much to learn. And, um, and I get reacquainted and reawakened to some things. And then I find myself um, contemplating or expanding thinking in ways that I might not have otherwise. So how have I changed? You know, I'm, I'm, I don't know that I can measure it other than in terms of maybe a certain sense of being more at ease mm -hmm. um, and less anxiety ridden about, am I doing it right enough? Is it the right way? If I were really a Gestalt therapist, if I were really Gestalt enough. <laughs> <laughs> You know that that becomes a conundrum, and you can be like a little um, like a little animal going around in circles, going after your own tail. <laughs> Does you seem to be responding to this? <laughs> Wonder why. <laughs> I, you know, I could project, but I would m much rather know. But again, this may or may not be the aesthetic time for you. To yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, you were saying that, that you learned a lot and that you are still learning. And I wonder, w how could you name it? What uh, you, as uh, Alan Singer, uh, how, how did you contribute to uh, Gestalt therapy and uh, AGT? And I have my own hy hypothesis uh, with. <laughs> Some evidence, uh, <laughs> you know, how people from our gender and sexual diversity group uh, honor your honor your presence and your work for, uh, you know, for people uh, LGBT people and within AGT and within Gestalt therapy. I, I don't know. Maybe you will go into another direction, but I would like you to say something maybe uh, with re reference to this point. Thank you. Thank you for asking, <laughs> showing your interest. Love that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How am I not supposed to love that? Um, well, when I think about contributions, hopefully I contribute like we all do just by showing up with our being and with our presence and with our interest and curiosity and ability to witness and be present and to engage that's foundational right um i was also asked by gordon wheeler who is um connected with the gestalt institute um the uh, the press the gestalt press um he does a, a tremendous amount of writing and so forth and he was very interconnected with sonia nevis and he was uh, putting together a compilation of, um, of chapters for a book that uh, he was involved with co-editing um, on intimate ground, a Gestalt therapy, um, um, you know, whatever, guide to couples therapy. I forgot the, um, oh, I've got it right over here. Let's yeah. see. I've got, oh, I've got two of the books that I've contributed chapters to. Um, anyways, I'll... Yeah. Wow, I'm just demonstrating movement and how movement yes. can be part of um, the experience. Mm -hmm. um, on intimate ground, a gestalt approach to working with couples. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So he asked, uh, because he knew um, Sonia, and he asked for who she might recommend to contribute a chapter on um, issues related to gay couples. There's a separate uh, chapter written by actually a colleague who, of mine who was in that therapy group as well. Raylene Curtis, um, she did a, um, a chapter on lesbian couples, working with lesbian couples. Um, and, you know, that was, you know, before perhaps be considering bisexuality in, in coupling or transgender identification in coupling. I mean, there are so many ways to, that, that as a um, culture, we've moved along in our um, understanding and, um, and uh, welcoming out into visibility the, um, variety of our beings and all of the different multifacetednesses that are part of our beings, including sexual orientation, gender identity, etc. At any rate, um, Gordon asked if I would contribute a chapter, and, um, and so I did. I worked on that chapter. 
Um, it was really a challenge for me writing because even though I do write, mm -hmm. um, it's so, I found it so isolating mm -hmm. and I'd get much more energy. I think I'm more on the extroversion side of that scale. I get more energy and in interaction. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> writing the chapter was like, you know, after a certain point, um, and then he had, you know, his editorial responsibilities and you know, I needed to do some further writing or, you know, uh, re amending certain aspects. And at the conclusion of that, I just remember saying to Gordon, <laughs> Gordon, if this chapter is kind of like bringing a baby into the world, I think I'm going to give this one up for foster or uh, for adoption. <laughs> Feel free, take it, do whatever you want with it. Um, anyways, he seemed to like what I did enough to include it as part of that book on, on intimate ground. And then he came back um, a couple of years after that for asking me to contribute another chapter, which I did to a book called The Voice of Shame. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, mm -hmm. so I did a chapter on, on homosexuality, meditations on the cultural violation of self. Mm -hmm. And so I did a next chapter on that. And then a few years after that, Mark McConville, who does a lot of writing on adolescence, asked if I would be interested in contributing a chapter on um, LGBTQ plus, I didn't even know that there was a Q plus as part of that mm -hmm. um, at that point, um, on adolescent um, developmental issues related to um, you know, sexual orientation, gender identity. But I think it was more on the sexual orientation end of things that I wrote. Um, and with each of these chapters, um, I don't know, I wrote them and it's like, you know, sometimes speaking out loud, did I say anything, uh, you know, that was really useful, worthwhile, of value? Maybe that's a, an old rubric from growing up, you know, in relation to social abuse conditions, et cetera. Um, but, you know, it's something that I carry as part of my being in the world. You know, uh, does it, whatever I, I at a certain point i just have to trust i wrote what i wrote as long as they want it god bless may someone or a, another find some value in it and over the course of time i've heard some people let me know oh something that i wrote and actually each one of these books someone said something that they found of value mm -hmm. and i i guess i always feel <laughs> really ple pleasantly surprised. I think, oh, really? Great. I'll have to read it sometime. <laughs> um, so that was one thing that, you know, I will, I, I'm going to do my best right now to own as a contribution. Mm -hmm. um, uh, even though there's a part of me that I guess is still somewhat suspect of, no, oh, well, what did I really have to say? And who knows, maybe what I said is dated. Oh, no. You know, you can drive yourself crazy. Otherwise, you know, you know, just accept it and just be well with it. And so I'm going to, I'm going to leave with that. Um, it's kind of more of an intentional willing that, you know, I wrote some things. <laughs> I hope that they're of value. I've heard from a few people, they got touched by it. I love knowing that. I love them um, in my heart of hearts when I'm able to be present in a way that feels touching, um, heartfelt, you know, and that it feels like there's a, a connecting of the hearts between myself and it and another so um so that's what I'm, I'm saying about that contribution gordon after i wrote that first chapter this is back i think around 1995 he said alan there's an organization called aagt they're going to have their first um or they're going to have a conference in new orleans it's you know the first or among the earliest of their conferences i think you ought to go and you know maybe see if there are some other LGBTQ plus folks who might be there and might be interested in gathering. You can organize like a lunch table or whatever. So I said, okay, you know, sometimes I like being invited out to the dance. You know, if I'm invited, okay, well, why not? Um, and so I did. I went to New Orleans and organized what became, I think there were three lunch tables worth of people who were interested in LGBTQ plus uh, you know, interests, um, whether they identified in whatever ways they did, because, you know, I don't like to be exclusionary. You know, we're all on, um, you know, the dimensions of our 
our um, being, including sexual orientation, wherever we are, gender identity, wherever we are, yeah, we're all part of the young, um, we're all part of the party. At any rate, so there was this big response and, um, and then I wound up doing that at subsequent conferences because, uh, you know, I got um, really enamored of AGT and then I started organizing these groups. Alas, I'm among the most technologically illiterate of my generation. Um, maybe not, but I, you know, kind of give myself that mantle. And so to organize that into something sustaining in between conferences, I just didn't have the technological wherewithal. And, um, you know, some various people tried to, you know, add support in, in that dimension. But it wasn't until um, the GSD committee got formed, co-chaired by Daniel and Billy, um, that, you know, there, there, there's now a continuity and this wonderful way of connecting with each other in between. Um, I think it was Daniel that reached out to me because I had, you know, had all these earlier experiences organizing these, and I did workshops at, oh, that's right, I did workshops at, mm -hmm. at AAGT. Um, and I did, I did also, I, oh, I led um, a personal growth group. This is for gay and bisexual men at Esalen. Mm -hmm. um, I was invited by Gordon to, to do that. So I did that for about three years in a row. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I mean, I could have continued on with that, but you know, I, I thought, oh, you know, it's a lot of anxiety that I, I bear when I go out there doing it by myself. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I could have been more creative and found somebody to co-lead with. But I said, you know, three years, it's like I've shown up, I did it, I can feel good about it. <laughs> um, and then I've done these other kinds of... Mm. Hmm. Okay. Mm. to warm up <laughs> there you are yes did you lose did i did i um get whatever Who knows? Yeah. you froze and now you're now you're back in your animated yeah. self yeah. at any rate i've shown up in various ways to to um speak to use my voice mm -hmm. um to um regulate and embrace my anxiety and flow with it enough into the excitement of being out in the world in all of these different ways. So I like thinking that I've contributed um, in the course of these other ways of contributing. Mm -hmm. And now at these Gestalt conferences, I love uh, being, um, you know, kind of co-coordinating the cabaret mm -hmm. evenings. Yes. It brings up that musical and performance end and that part of my desire to have other people express their voices and channel their their, um, you know, spirits in the entertainment facility um, and dance and movement. I mean, how wonderful to be able to exercise that part of my being in a Gestalt framework. So, mm -hmm. yes, uh, all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and uh, what uh, if you were to name some of the most challenging moments in uh, throughout this uh, Gestalt uh, trainings and then teachings and uh, working with clients? What, what would that be? I mean, the most challenging ones. Hmm. 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 For me, well, a particular personal challenge was just relaxing into my anxiety enough mm -hmm. and dealing with those introjected mm -hmm. um, beliefs about, mm -hmm. am I good enough? Am I doing it right enough? Mm -hmm. um, I think growing up and coming into identifying as gay, mm -hmm. there's a certain sense of diverging from what is considered a normative in quotes trap in life and how you get to be living a good enough being um, according to certain social proscriptions. Um, that that can be a part of that rubric, along with whatever those personal, um, you know, uh, bullying experiences um, inculcated. So I think sitting in my therapist um, chair and in that and having that part of my my bearing with uh, with clients, that's been 
that's been just a one of those rubrics, one of those interjections that um, I've had to be with, become aware of, um, kind of work on re-interjecting. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if I think of um, our our internal voices as being like a, a chorus or a um, orchestra, you know, sometimes the conductor has to raise certain volumes and certain sections and certain parts of the and like lower the other parts so that's you know a part of Mm self-regulating um and um and channeling my my um moods my my beliefs in ways that can serve me in being with others and learning that you know trust in trust and call it the dialogic process call it the correlational cultivation of relatedness that um that i'm going to learn from how someone is with me by listening to the melody as well as the lyrics of how they're you know expressing themselves by um just paying attention and noticing and then being aware of my own internal process trusting that that will inform my noticing what becomes figural in my interest with another person and offering that, but offering it in a way that I don't have to be right. I don't have to determine any one thing or another about its usefulness because I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna trust that I'm gonna learn in the relationship and in the responsiveness and in paying attention Mm -hmm. to see what's useful and what's not. Um, I love that about uh, gestalt, um, what I call a gestalt humility, that you know, I, I don't have to be, in quotes, the expert. I may have expertise from knowledge, from learning, from training. I don't want to discount that. And I don't have to claim that I am, in quotes, the expert, because I'm with somebody who is, in, in, in a sense, an expert of charting their own life and mapping out their own experience, and that I'm being invited along um, to um, to understand together how a person has come into whatever their experiences are and what's challenging about that and what's um, enlivening about that and all of the other things that we might you know configure into our impressions of another person and and then offer awareness um, and and then see what happens and then the experiments that come out of awareness, that come out of the curiosity and the excitement about some something new that may emerge. I mean, it's all part of the theory. The When you're asking again about the challenge, it's about my being able to relax enough over the course of time. And I think come, some of this just necessarily has to come over time with experience mm-hmm. and, um, and learning to trust that mm-hmm. I will, I will be present and then somebody else will be present with me and we'll be present together and scratch our heads together and use our awareness together and see what happens, see what, what turns out to be useful and what doesn't, doesn't. Hmm. Uh, this uh, r- relaxing um, issue or uh, aspect re- uh, really resonates in me. I mean, yeah, I can feel you. Uh, here very very well and uh, uh, even uh, the very fact how relaxed I can see you and I consider you then uh, yeah I would like it to be my (laughs) trajectory as well uh, you know Uh, yeah Mm. you know what I'll say one more thing and I would well I'll say two more things one is that I took in a I noticed myself wanting to take in a deep breath and an exhale um, as I concluded, and then you were sharing that you're resonating with the notion of relaxing, um, you know, and how that might be somehow useful and integral for, for yourself. Um, but, but I'm thinking that um, what really has been super challenging is with meeting with esteemed others, and maybe it's my penchant for over idealizing, um, but, you know, whether it's my trainers from the Gestalt Institute of New England, or Sonia, or Irv and Miriam Polster, um, 
the Resnicks, you know, then Stella, whatever, all of these people, you know, Peter Philipson, you know, people who, Lynn Jacobs. Oh my God, there's so many people who offer so many, um, there, it's like diamonds with brilliant facets. There's so many facets of brilliance. Um, and so sometimes what I do with that is, oh my God, maybe, maybe I got to be more like them. Um, so that's part of, I think, a really big challenge is when I'm in the face of people that I really esteem um, to have to then breathe into myself once again and to not turn it into um you know some kind of comparative mm -hmm. self diminution mm -hmm. um um because you know we each show up and um you know we each offer our own our own beings and our own brilliances and our own capacities so that's that's i think a um maybe an ongoing life challenge <laughs> Um, yeah, very cool. Yeah, it's, it's very uh, nicely said. Yeah, I like it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe it will be a last question, I guess. Uh, how, how would you, yeah, uh, we, we are discussing it and we are, uh, you know, uh, trying to, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, we are discussing uh, your um, gestalt career and and so on, and and uh, also some general uh, uh, I don't know processes in uh, in AAGT and in uh, gestalt therapy and people and so on. And I wonder how you see the the future of uh, gestalt therapy. Uh, mm. Yes. Well, I'm 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 hoping to be hopeful mm -hmm. and I am inspired when I see um, people of various ages um, who are interested in interested in Gestalt who are learning training who are offering their own perspectives informed at least in part by Gestalt um, and so that part I find really encouraging. I wish for our theory and therapy to become more well-regarded and more known. I wish for it to be taught in more mainstream university settings. Um, you know, I think that the, the, the people that are working on research um, and looking at, um, you know, evidentiary um, produced efficacy of Gestalt therapy, um, evidence-based, you know, uh, um, proof of, of its worth and value and usefulness. Um, if there's ways of cultivating that, even though there's another part of, you know, the founders of Gestalt that may not have been so concerned about authoritarian acceptance, and legalities and regularities and so forth. Um, so that, with that also in parentheses, there's a part of me that, that wants Gestalt not to be marginalized in the spectrum of therapy um, theories and that, it ha that it's got such richness and value. Why wouldn't I want more people to become aware of it um, and it's, there's an interplay, it's in the back of my associative mind here, you know, kind of growing up in a marginalized um, community as a now gay identified man um, and learning what it's like to be on the margins. And there are so many people who experience themselves marginalized, whether it's around racial mm -hmm. or ethne ethnic or um, class, uh, you know, experience, um, uh, religious identifications, whatever. There's so many ways for people to feel marginalized in life. Um, so I don't want to, you know, just hang my hat on, on uh, sexual orientation um, per se in this case or gender identity, but um, in terms of my own case, sexual orientation. Um, 
I'd like, I'd like more inclusivity. I'd like more presence in the world for Gestalt theory's richness to be known and, um, and be able to be of service in, in this globe. Because God knows we need as much in the service of this globe's, um, our little planet's um, well-being and rebalancing um, you know, before it's too late. So, so that, in terms of my hopefulness, I love seeing, I love seeing you here, Pamela and um, Camila. Mm -hmm. Camila. Yes. And um, I feel hopeful about my ability to learn to pronounce your name over enough practice. Um, and I feel hopeful enough, you know, about, again, people who are younger um, and being present and voicing presence um, to be, to be inhabiting and embodying Gestalt theory and, and therapy, and then um, mm -hmm. for it to become more a part of a, um, a less marginalized part of our therapy world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we can uh, stop the recording now, and I will come back. To you? Oh my God! I f I never feel that you left me. <laughs> <laughs>